All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Discovery Reading. My name is Marie, and today I am sitting in front of our beautiful butterfly display because we are going to talk about uh, different kinds of pollinators and pollination. We'll mostly be talking about bumblebees today, but we, I will talk about a few other kinds of pollinators today. Uh, butterflies are pollinators, which is why I'm sitting in front of our butterfly display. Okay, so the first book we're going to read is called The Bumblebee Queen by April Poliser and illustrated by Patricia J. Uh, Wynn. And we are given permission to read this by Charles Bridge Books. All right, let's get started. The Bumblebee Queen begins the spring below ground and all alone. Bumblebees are native to North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. There are 250 bumblebee species. She digs out, she flies, hungry, she seeks flowers. She drinks nectar with her long, hairy tongue. So there's her, very, there's her long tongue right there. Bumblebees have very, very long tongues so that they can drink the nectar from the flowers. We'll talk about the difference between nectar and pollen in a second. She begins to search behind the barn, beyond the lake. She buzzes around the bushes, between the fields. Bumblebees rarely sting, but they will sting in defense and can sting more than once. So the bumblebee queen is searching for a place to start her colony. She is looking for a place to build her colony. A puddle? No. A bush? No. An old mouse nest? Yes. Bumblebees nest in the ground or in sheltered, mossy, grassy places such as old mouse nests or abandoned bird houses. Queens have even nested in teapots. Now she prepares. She visits flowers and drinks nectar. She gathers pollen. She makes a waxy cup called her honey pot. In it, she stores nectar that she will eat on stormy days when it is not good weather for flying. The bee's body produces wax that squeezes out in little tiles from between the segments of her abdomen. She pulls off the tiles with her feet then choose them to form her honey pot. So the queen, the nectar, I mean, sorry, the wax comes from the queen's body. Then she chews it up and she uses that to make a, this honey pot right here. Let's learn what the honey pot is for. She forms some of the pollen into a lump. She lays, she lays eggs in it and adds a wax covering. After the eggs hatch, the queen chews a small hole in the wax covering and pushes food to the larvae. So, can you guys see that? Yeah. So the queen is making a little Kind of like a little nest, I guess, for her eggs, which are also called a uh, larvae. So she lays her eggs in the honey pot, or so she makes a little wax covering for her eggs, and then she keeps nectar in the honey pot. In five days, the eggs hatch. They are lumpy, plump larvae. 
No buzzing, no flying, just wiggling. So the larvae look like little, kind of like white worms a little bit. And those will turn into bumblebees. The larvae eat pollen. The queen brings more. The larvae grow wiggling and chewing. As the larvae grow bigger, the wax covering cracks. The queen repairs it and enlarges it. So there's the wax covering that is covering the larvae and it's keeping them safe. And as the larvae are growing, um, the wax cracks and the queen will repair the cracks with more wax. Then one sp spring day, the larvae spins cocoons. The larvae spin cocoons 10 to 14 days after hatching. The outer layers of silk harden and yellow, so the larvae no longer need the wax covering of the pollen clump for protection. The queen gets rid of the extra wax. So because the larvae are spinning, they're spinning their own little covering so that the queen doesn't have to keep making the wax bigger and bigger. Let's see. But the queen bee keeps working. She collects nectar. She gathers pollen. She lays more eggs. In between her other duties, the queen snuggles up to the new eggs. Heat from her body goes through a goes through a bare patch on her abdomen to warm the eggs. It's kind of similar to what birds do. They sit on their eggs to make them warm. The bee is also doing the same thing, kind of. She's laying on top of her eggs to keep them warm. And she's able to do that because she has a bare patch on her abdomen, which is that, her um, abdomen is that part right there. In 10 days, the, cocoon, the cocoons ripen. The queen chews them open. Bees emerge, wings fanning. Now the queen has helpers. Worker bees are gray when they emerge, but their adult coloring starts to show in a few days. So now the cocoons have opened and the new bees are coming out and they're gray. The new workers gather nectar and pollen to feed the larvae. The first, the first worker bees of the season are the smallest. Later in the season, the workers are bigger. This may be partly because as the colony grows, more workers can gather food for the larvae. Summer simmers. The colony grows, the queen lays more eggs. Some form workers, some form drones. Some will, be new, some will become new queens. Workers, workers are females that are smaller than the queen. Workers do the hive chores. Drones are stingless males whose only job is to mate, to help produce next year's bees. So you can see the difference between the queen, the workers, and the drones. There's the queen. In the middle is the worker, and on the end is the drone. So all workers are females, and then the drones are males. And the queen is the biggest. A bumblebee colony can contain from 30 to 400 bees. That's a lot of bees. In fall, nights chill and flowers shrivel. New queens and drones emerge from the hive. Scientists aren't sure what signals an egg to become a queen or a worker.
Drones from many colonies zoom across the fields, dabbing drops of bee perfume. New queens follow the perfume highways to, to find drones and mate with them. Workers, drones, and queens all eat nectar. Any nectar that is not eaten by the bee right away is kept in honey pots. As water evaporates from the nectar, it becomes honey. The new queens drink nectar, search for soft earth, then dig down to wait for spring. While underground, from fall to spring, the new queens go without food, sometimes as long as six months between meals. But the workers, the drones, and the old queen bee stay above ground. They die. They cannot survive the cold. So the new queens, they dig in the ground and to keep themselves safe from the cold weather of winter and they wait until it's spring and when spring comes then the new queens will uh, crawl out of the ground and uh, start to build their own colony. Old bee, queen of the bumblebees, won't see, won't see next spring come, but her daughters, the new queens, will fly across the fields and build colonies of their own. In northern Canada, the entire bumblebee season is only a few weeks long, but in the southern United States, colonies may last for many months. Near the equator, bumblebee colonies may live year-round. All right, I think that is the end. Yep, that's the end. There is a little bit more information in the back about uh, bumblebees. Let's see. Um, let's read part of it. So this part says, get to know the different kinds of bees in your area. Most bees and wasps are gentle and rarely, if ever, sting. The key is to be calm and to look where you put your hands and feet. If you are, if you are observant, you will notice holes uh, in the ground where bees or wasps come out and go regularly. Regularly. Avoid these places, which bees or wasps are likely to descend. It's safer to observe bees and wasps, wasps feeding on flowers. Let's see. And we'll read another short paragraph. Well, we'll read this section right here. There's almost 4,000 kinds of bees that are native to the United States. Yet the bee that most people know, the honeybee, is not a native species. It was brought here by European settlers. Honeybees are used to make honey and pollinate crops. Native bees pollinate many plants that honeybees do not. Bumblebees pollinate by a special, by a special process called buzz poll pollination. When a bumblebee flies, its hair builds up stat a static charge. It enters the flower, grabs one of the flower's anthers, and uh, the, bu the bumblebee shakes the anther and makes a loud buzzing sound. The pollen, shaken from inside the anth from inside the anther, is attracted by the electrostatic charge of the bee. So it jumps a short distance and sticks to the bee. Honeybees cannot pollinate egg eggplant and tomato flowers. Uh, bumblebees can't. So whenever you eat a tomato, think a bumblebee. All right, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, it was talking, so it was talking about a way that uh, bumblebees pollinate. So they build up static on their body, and whenever they go inside a flower, the pollen is attracted to the to the bumblebee because um, they have electricity. They have a little static charge on them. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So that was called the bumblebee queen. Um, let's see. Let's show you this. Um, I have a wasp's nest with me, um, but it's kind of similar to a bumblebee hive. Um, here's the wasp's nest. Um, so bumblebees will also make the, um, I 
I guess honeybees do. Um, honeybees will make the um, hexagon, hexagon is six sided, right? Um, they'll make the little, I forgot what they're called. I don't remember. If anybody knows what these little things are called, the comb, yes. They'll make the comb and um, they'll put the honey, honeybees will put the honey in it and um, yeah, that's part of their, the, the honeybee hive. Uh, but this is a wasp nest, it's a little bit different. Um, you can see this is the outside of it, this is the inside. Yeah, pretty cool that wasps and bees are able to make, make things like this. All right, we'll put this back. And let me show you this here. So here are some, I think this is mostly wasps, but there might be a couple of bees in there. I think that maybe this one might be a bee right here. I'm just guessing. I think it's a bee, but I'm not 100% sure. Mm, let's see. I'm guessing, I think this one may also be. Again, not 100% sure, but they're just really cool to look at. Bees and wasps, wasps are very closely related, so that is why they look similar. All right, let's see. I'll tell you one more cool thing about bees. Um, actually, I'll save it for the end. I'll save that for the end. And let's just go ahead and read our next book, which is called Pick, Pull, and Snap. Where Once a Flower Bloomed by Lola M. Schaefer and illustrated by Lindsay Barrett George. And we're given permission to read this by uh, Harper Collins Publishers. All right, let's get started. Okay. The spring sun shines bright. At the trellis, a cool breeze chills noses and shakes free the pollen inside early white flowers. Deep in the flowers, seeds the size of freckles grow inside a thin green skin. Rains wash the dried flower petals away and the seeds plump. On a spring day, pick Handfuls of pea pods from the vines where once a flower bloomed. Picking the pea pods. In the berry patch, bumblebees zigzagged from blossom to blossom, spreading pollen inside delicate white flowers, no bigger than a fingertip. Deep inside the flowers, Hard seeds grow in bits of fruit that form a cluster. The flowers curl and blow away, and in a few weeks, the fruit turns red in the warm sunshine. <laughs> On a summer morning, pull ripe raspberries from the bush where once a flower bloomed. Fields, wind waves golden tassels high above heads, and pollen floats through the air to the skill to the silk of a flower. Inside the husk, hundreds of pale seeds grow side by side. The silks of the flower shrivel and brown, while the seeds fill with fill with a milky juice. On a hot summer day, snap. An ear of corn from the stalk where once a flower bloomed. In the orchard, a honeybee buzzes from tree to tree, flying in and out of blossoms. Its legs brush pollen inside a fragrant pink flower. Deep inside the flower, a small green fruit grows around one seed. The petals fade and drop to the ground. Weeks pass and the fruit 
large and sweet, hangs low near passing eyes. On a late summer day, twist a fuzzy peach from the tree from the tree where once a flower bloomed. On a sandy hill, yellow blossoms open on knee-high plants, spilling soft pollen between their petals. At evening, they close and wilt. From the, from the blossoms, pegs grow and push into the soil. Underground, the tips of the pegs become stiff shells, each holding two seeds wrapped in a red skin. On a hot summer day, pull hidden peanuts from under the bush where once a flower bloomed. Let me know if anybody has ever been uh, raspberry picking or peach picking. I love picking fruit. Going and picking fruit is a lot of fun. And if you guys haven't done it before, you guys should definitely go do it. It's a lot of fun. All right. In the garden, a bumblebee darts between giant blossoms, entering one after another, scattering pollen inside a yellow flower, uh, a yellow flower open wide. Under the flower, flat, smooth seeds grow in a round, hard fruit. The, petal dro the petals droop, and each day the fruit grows bigger and bigger and bigger. On the last day of summer, roll a heavy orange pumpkin from the vine where once a flower bloomed. Yeah, a lot of pumpkin patches are open now and you're able to go and pick your own pumpkins. and. While you're out picking your pumpkins, think about where the pumpkin came from. Um, think about how um, a bee or some other pollinator took pollen from one flower to another flower, and then a seed grow, grew from that flower, and then eventually a giant pumpkin grew where once a flower bloomed. So yeah, that is how pollination works. Um, different animals like bees or butterflies or even bats and hummingbirds will go to a flower looking for nectar and these animals will eat nectar. So hummingbirds eat nectar, uh, bumblebees eat nectar. And while they're drinking the nectar, they end up getting pollen on their bodies, which is kind of like a yellow dust um, nectar is kind of like a sugar water, but pollen is a dust that sticks to the animal's body. And when the animal goes to another flower, they, um, the pollen will go to that flower. This, um, it's kind of hard to explain if I can't show you. Um, but yeah, animals go from flower to flower, taking pollen with them and that's how flowers are fertilized. Um, there's a little section in the back of this book. Oh, there's one more part I didn't read. Now winter winds blow past the empty trellis. Spindly canes, bleached stalks, bare trees, withered plants, and wrinkled vines. But in the spring, plants blossom again. Pollen dusts the inside of flowers and seeds and fruit begin to grow. On a bright warm day, gather a new harvest where once a flower bloomed. Yeah, that's a nice little book. There's some more in the back, back here. I'll read a little bit of it. Every seed or fruit begins in a flower. A bee enters a flower looking for food called nectar. Soft hairs on its legs and body pick up grains of pollen. Then the bee flies to another flower and carries the pollen with it. 
Some of the pollen falls off the bee's body and into the second flower. This is called pollination. Deep inside the flower, the pollen reaches a part of the plant called the pistil. This is called fertilization. After a flower is fertilized, seeds and fruit begin to grow. Bees are just one type of pollinator. Beetles, flies, ants, butterflies, hummingbirds, and bats can be pollinators too. Sometimes pollen is carried from one flower, from flower to flower by wind or water. Other flowers like the tomato and the peanut pollinate themselves. In those plants, the flowers pollen ripens and falls into its own pistil and the seed begins to grow. So yeah, the book explained pollination a lot better than I did. Uh, but yeah, that's pollination and fertilization. So I'll try to show this picture to you guys. If you can see it clearly, um, it shows you the different parts of the flower that are important for fertilization. Um, so let's see, all of those little yellow dots right there, those are called the anthers. And the anthers are what have the pollen on them. And then, um, oh, the whole part, the entire thing is called the stamen. Uh, but the little part on top is called the anther. And then um, right there, going through the middle of the flower, that's the pistil. So the whole goal is to get pollen um, on top of the pistil or in the pistil. And that is fertilization. All right, so yeah, that is uh, all the books I have for you today. But I'm going to show you a couple of more, um, a couple other cool things that I brought with me. Uh, let's start with this. So I brought a little hummingbird with me. It's a little, little um, specimen that we have. I'll come over here. So some flowers are actually designed specifically well, for specific animals. So like the hummingbird, you can see the hummingbird has a very long beak and that's because the hummingbird prefers um, flowers that have very, that are, that are very long and they have um, kind of like a tube. Um, so the petals are on the outside and then the flower is like a tube and at the bottom is where the nectar is. Um, so the hummingbirds will reach deep inside that flower with their long beak and drink the nectar. So yeah, uh, hummingbirds are a type of pollinator. Let's see, I have some butterflies to show you. Butterflies, I think, are one of the pollinators that we know the best. Um, they do the same thing, they go from flower to flower and get pollen on their bodies. And they also, hummingbird, I mean, butterflies also drink nectar. And animals that only drink nectar are called nectivores. Here's some more butterflies. They're so beautiful. Let's see, I'll show you this other animal. Ooh, you have to be very careful. It's very fragile, but this is a bat. Um, I'm not sure what kind of bat it is. Let's check. It is a Mexican free-tailed bat. But that's what they look like. A lot of people think bats are scary because some of them are drink blood. Um, but bats are not scary at all. They're very, very important animals. Uh, they're very important in pollination and they're fairly harmless. Um, I think some bats can uh, carry babies, um, but um, I don't think it's very common for people to get bitten by bats. Mm. They're actually kind of, I think they're cute. Um, they're just kind of like flying, um, kind of, they look kind of look like flying mice to me. They're not mice, they're bats, but that's kind of what they look like. And bats are the only mammal that can actually fly. We do have, there are things like flying squirrels, 
but they actually don't fly, they only glide. They can't actually fly. So we're gonna put this back. Okay. I just have one more thing to show you and then we'll call it we'll call it a day. So here I have this is um it's kind of like a house or a hotel. It's like a hotel for bees. Uh, there's some types of bees that don't live in colonies. They're called solitary bees and they live by themselves. Um, so instead of living in a colony, they'll go find a little hole somewhere and make their home in that little area. So here's um, an example of what solitary bees could live in. Um, it, we call it a bee hotel. Um, one of our educators made these uh, during our summer camp last, last summer and uh, we were able to decorate them and then we took them home and put them in our backyards uh, to, uh, for the, all the solitary bees that needed a home. So it was a fun little activity that we did in our summer camp last summer. Yeah, so if you well, if you want to, you could make your own bee hotel. Just drill some holes in a piece of wood and stick it in your backyard and that will make a really good home for some solitary bees. And solitary bees are very, they're harmless. They're not really aggressive because they're not guarding anything. They're not guarding honey or nectar. Um, so yeah, they don't have anything to guard. So they're not aggressive. They're very uh, harmless. And um, yeah, bees are really cool. Um, and so are all, all the other kinds of pollinators. That's all I have for you today. Um, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you learned something cool. And um, yeah, I hope, you, I hope to see you next week. Uh, we do discovery reading every Thursday at 11 a.m. Um, on, on Thursdays, I think I said that. Uh, but yeah, we'll see you next week. Goodbye, everyone.